and I'm never sure exactly when this starts uh, appearing on YouTube, but hello to those of you who are joining us on YouTube. Um, we are just starting our June volunteer gathering. I'm very excited I'm sure for you exactly to when. join us. <laughs> Um, in our YouTube format and for those of you who are joining us on Zoom. Um, so with that, I think we are ready to get started. Um, so I will turn it over to Allison to start the gathering. All right. Hello, everyone. It is great to see everyone here tonight. And we have a great presentation about the upcoming exhibit. And I do have a few updates for everyone. We are thrilled to welcome three interns to the site. Haji Salim is interning with Mallory in the development department and the intern, internship is being hosted by Cal State Long Beach. Nikita Lynch is interning with Sarah and myself in the curatorial department and the internship is hosted by the Getty Marrow program. And Jocelyn Munoz is interning with Alana in the education department and this is also a Getty Marrow program internship. So we're very excited to have all three on staff this summer. All the internships are a combination of virtual and on-site. So when you see these three, please give them a big hello and we look forward to their contributions this summer. Also, as we all know, COVID protocols have been changing on monthly basis, sometimes weekly, daily basis within the last 15 months. As of today, they have adjusted again. And we do have some new broad policies that we are putting on into place starting tomorrow. I've also talked with Pam Lee, the executive director at Rancho Los Alamitos, and both ranchos are going to be moving in the same direction. So those new policies are no masks outside, that includes volunteers, staff, and the public. Masks are required inside for volunteers and the public. Masks are also required for staff working inside in shared spaces. We will have a one-way path of travel at the house, even in the work wing. There does not not need to be a path of travel in the gardens since it is outside. We will keep sanitizing through June 28th. OSHA is making some, is having a vote this Thursday about some new rules about masks and social distancing. Nothing has been really said about sanitizing, but we'll keep that protocol in place until the 28th. And then we will keep the reservation system for tickets going. It's not necessarily required for the public to make reservations, but we do want to keep that system in place. Um, and we are also experimenting with offering guided tours in addition to the self-paced and Clue tours that we have now. Staff has been working with docents on refresher courses, and while there are still kinks to be worked out, we are moving to offer a docent led tour in addition to our self paced and Clio tours. So things continue to adjust, but it's exciting that things are opening up. We don't have to wear masks outside anymore if you're vaccinated. And please understand everyone is on the honor system. If you're not vaccinated, you should be wearing a mask. However, we do not ask, it's an honor system. So if you're fully vaccinated, no masks outside, which is pretty exciting. So things will continue to update, but right now that's where we're at. We're looking good on numbers, COVID cases are down. California is frankly looking pretty astounding. So we're excited about this and we'll keep you apprised as we move forward, but that's where we are at right now. All right, so Tessa, I believe I'm turning it over to you. That's right, thank you, Allison. Thank you for that fabulous update. Um, I actually have a good segue because it's a outdoor related gathering. Um, 
and I have to start by saying just how wonderful it was to see so many of you last night in person uh, to honor Sarah and all of her contributions. Um, it was a great opportunity to get together and test, um, test it out what it feels like in the backyard with so many people gathering again. Um, as I've reported at previous volunteer gatherings last year, uh, the Rancho canceled um, our two major fundraising events, and we had to pivot all of our site use events. Many of them have been rescheduled to this summer, thankfully. Some of them chose to do small elopement style ceremonies that we were still allowed to have. But there, we, there was a major um, financial consequence to not be able to have events on site. So there was a, a loss of revenue. And when we put together the calendar for this year, we wanted to do an event um, where we could welcome people back safely. And so it just happened to be uh, the year for our golf outing. And our golf outing volunteers who have been with us now um, are John Fielder, Frank Newell, and Kathy Tomasulo. And so the three volunteers have been getting together for several months to plan this event. And we partner with Virginia Country Club. They let us use the course. Um, they are so generous with us on a Saturday afternoon. So I wanted to make sure that you all knew you are invited to the golf outing if you're a golf if you're a golfer. Uh, if you're not a golfer, which I'm not, um, the golf committee also wanted to make sure that this event was as inclusive as possible because so many of us haven't been able to gather and come back together. So they wanted to make sure that the dinner portion of the golf outing had a a different focus. So we're gonna get together from 5.30 to 7.30 after golf in the backyard to have dinner. It's a full barbecue and drinks and to unveil the 1930s living room, which I know Sarah will speak about more later. But this event is our first attempt at a fundraiser. Uh, it's going to help with our revenue and to try to recoup some of the revenue loss from last year. It's an opportunity to get back together and have sort of the similar tone that we did last night where we're going to socialize and eat and celebrate and, and look and at the new room and celebrate the campaign's achievements through this time. And so I just wanted to make sure that everybody knew um, that it was happening July 31st. The dinner portion is on the website now. If you'd like to purchase tickets, you can always call me anytime and I'd be happy to help you with it as well. And you're invited to golf if you'd like to golf and we, we hope you can join us to support the Rancho on July 31st. Thanks everybody. Good evening, everyone. I'm so happy to be here with you and I wanna reiterate and echo Tessa's sentiments about how lovely it was to be together in person yesterday evening. It was really special to see volunteers and staff spending time together on the Rancho lawn. Um, so my topic for this evening is about our upcoming exhibit, Raices de Long Beach, Roots of the Rancho. And so I wanna share a bit about this part of the rancho's history and the research that's been going into that and our plans for that. Uh, so I want to start off with just a little bit of an overview of how this ties into what the Rancho has been doing. So our previous few exhibits have really focused on diverse stories, um, kind of expanding the lens of who we talk about at the Rancho. So we had an exhibit about the Chinese immigrants building on Ying and Fan stories. And then our most recent exhibit, Teva Hagna to Today, focusing on Tongva history and culture. Um, and with both of these exhibits, we really benefited from collaborating with uh, these communities uh, to have this representation at the Rancho. Um, and we really received positive public responses and reactions to these exhibits. We had new audiences coming to the site and engaging with our, with our exhibits and with our programs. And so this is building on, on that work for the site. 
Uh, so this new exhibit focuses on what we've often referred to as the tenant period. So this runs from the late 19th to the early 20th century, really focusing on people of Mexican descent who lived at the Rancho. So I'm gonna open up my slideshow now so we have some photographs to enjoy. So you should all see my slideshow now. So Rancho Los Cerritos is opening a new exhibit that will focus on the Mexican and Mexican American people who lived in the historic adobe and really helped shape Long Beach in the late 19th and early 20th century. The Bixby family moved out of the adobe and sold parcels of Rancho Los Cerritos land beginning in the 1880s. And the area formerly used for sheep ranching was transformed into farms. And in 1921, the Virginia Country Club relocated to its current location where it stands today, right next door to the adobe. And the adobe home was divided into small apartment dwellings to house the people who worked on the neighboring farms and at the country club and neighboring dairies. I think. So many of the Rancho Los Cerritos tenants of this period of the 1880s through the 1920s were either immigrants of Mexico or first generation Mexican Americans. And there was a family network that was represented. So a number of the tenants were cousins or were distant relatives. And two of the tenants featured in this photograph, Manuel Liera and Concepcion Coronado, met while living with their respective families in the adobe. And they actually got married at Rancho Los Cerritos. Manuel and Concepcion went on to live together in their own apartment in the adobe and raise children. So the story of the Mexican and Mexican-American tenants is a really crucial one to tell. It's an important part of Rancho Los Cerritos history. And this also connects to the larger history of Long Beach and its transition from ranching to farming, eventually developing into the city that it is today. And the ancestry of the Rancho Los Cerritos tenants is reflective of California society during this time period of the 19th and early 20th century with backgrounds that are mixed between indigenous, Mexican, American, and European. Many of the tenant stories are part of the transnational history of Mexican immigration to the United States. The Rancho Los Cerritos archive houses a series of oral histories. And a number of these oral histories document the experiences of the tenants who lived in the adobe during this time period. The tenants or their descendants were interviewed between the 1960s and the 1990s. And with these interviews, we are able to document the lives of the people who lived here in the late 19th and early 20th century. These oral histories have recently informed the research projects for a group of college students, thanks to a partnership that we've cultivated between Rancho Los Cerritos and Cal State Long Beach. The history department at Cal State Long Beach has a capstone course, which students take to complete their history BAs during their senior year. And so that capstone course was hosted at Rancho Los Cerritos uh, during the spring 2018 semester. And during that semester, students utilized our oral history collection and other documents in our archives to produce their final research projects for the course. The oral histories, along with the research produced by the students, will be used to inform the exhibit about the Mexican and Mexican-American tenants of the Rancho's adobe from the 1880s to the 1920s. And the descendants of those who lived at the Rancho during this period are also contributing to this exhibit by loaning or donating personal family objects for display and by sharing details of their family histories. Um, a couple of years ago, we were able to walk the Virginia Country Club with Paul Liera, who was Manuel, who's Manuel Liera's son, uh, to talk about his experience and his father's experience working at Virginia Country Club. And photographed here is um, Jody Miller. She is the granddaughter of Concepcion and Manuel Liera, and she recently donated her grandmother's wedding dress, and that is now part of a permanent uh, part of our collection, and it will be featured in this exhibit. 
Raicista Long Beach, Roots of the Rancho, is a really exciting opportunity for Rancho Los Cerritos to share more of its history and to tell the stories of Mexican and Mexican-American community of Long Beach. And while this exhibit focuses on the people who lived at Rancho Los Cerritos, it is also about the larger history of Mexican and Mexican-Americans in Long Beach. And so I've been talking about these oral histories in our archives, and I really want to give you a sample of what we have in our holdings. Um, I'll, I'd like to play a brief excerpt for you in just a moment um, that features Manuel and Concepcion Liera talking about um, their experience living at the rancho. They were interviewed uh, several times. This excerpt comes from their 1970 interview. Um, and it's just one example of what we hold in our collection. And it's now digitized um, and available online thanks to a partnership with LA as subject when we had a resident archivist on site last year and early this year, digitizing a portion of our oral history collection. So I'm gonna switch over now. Uh, this clip begins when Manuel Liera is talking about when he first moved to Long Beach and to Rancho Los Cerritos. So let me just switch over to that clip now. And uh, Joe Hernandez, I lived with them. That, that was my mother's sister. Where did they live? We lived in Long Beach on uh, Golden Avenue. That was, uh, which is West Long Beach. Uh, <coughs> then uh, how, how and when did you come out here? Was it after the country club was built? Oh, uh, we then, well, time went by since I lived with my, my uncle, aunt and uncle. And I moved, we moved back. I moved back with my folks out towards uh, Disneyland again, where they lived. And uh, then uh, we made, made a trip to Ensenada, and then we came back, and we heard that uh, they needed uh, help over here at the club. It just started. And through one of my brother-in-laws, we got, I got connected here, and then we moved up here. My folks moved, uh, uh, Conception's folks lived here already. You were already here. Yes, we was already here. And then uh, they told uh, my folks that half of the house was vacant. So that's how they acquired the other half. And uh, they moved in, and I was working at the club at the time, which was about 19, uh, uh, spring of 1921, I believe. And uh, when was it you moved in? 1920. 1920. Do you know who had lived here before you? We've tried to figure out the sequence of people. I don't think uh, some people say it was vacant long periods of time, and I don't believe it. Mike Murillo was living here. Now, was he married then? Yes. And he lived here before you? Yes, ma'am. And he continued to live mm -hmm. here? Because he was related to you? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, he did. Did he have children living with yes, him? Yes, he had uh, she was two Tio, boys. Felipe and Clara. Felipe? Uh, uh, Felipe Clara. Uh, Felipe Clara. and Pio. Uh, um, and Claire, Clara. Well, they must have been pretty old, weren't they? Yes, they were. Yes, they were. Mm -hmm. Yes, they were. But they weren't young. I had, um, did he ever tell you how old he was? Mm, I don't recall at the time. He used to have quite extensive conversations. Oh, he used to come to the porch and tell us stories of how he used to work with George Bixby and bring cattle from Arizona and, oh. Take him to the harbor. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to stop it there, uh, but that's just a sample of the wealth of information we have in our archives. Um, and if you're familiar with the stories of Mike Murillo, he lived for a very long time and he was an incredible storyteller. And so there was some overlap between the time that the Lieras were um, in the Adobe and when Mike Murillo was. And so that's who they were referring to at the end um, and who's featured in this first photograph. Um, so. Right now, I will open up to any questions that you might have about the exhibit. There is Sally has her hand raised. Sally, I'll unmute you. I think you have to unmute yourself. Unfortunately, that was an error on my part. <laughs> I don't have a question. 
Thank you. So Sarah, this is Allison. I, I, I have a question. So I know this exhibit focuses on the um, Lieras. Does it bring in other families? You're on mute. <laughs> Uh, that's because Nicholas has things to say too, but we'll, we'll get to him. <laughs> um, yeah, so we will include other families. Um, the Lieras are, they were interviewed the most, but we have other families um, that were either connected to the Lieras or that were also history. Um, so the Coronados as well, um, the Arias family, the De Sigaron family, there's a number of families that, um, that whose stories intersect and who spend time at the rancho. And then I have a question I see in the chat, the process for the wedding dress. So textile restoration is a, an incredibly intensive and time consuming process um, because once textiles get to a certain age and I'm not an expert, I'm, I'm speaking from experience of working with a textile conservator. Once textiles reach a certain age, um, you can't just, you know, wash and dry or even dry clean the way we would now. Um, so it's it takes a lot of testing to see how materials will react to water or other chemicals. Um, so it needs to be assessed to see the condition. The dress has been folded up for a long time. It's been protected. It's been in a bag and, and been kept out of light, but it's silk. And silk doesn't age well um, for, those, for those who might have, you know, old dresses or wedding sitting folded up for a long time to make sure that you know when it's unfolded that it's done by an expert because there's a lot of risk involved um, when dealing with with silk that's older so uh, that's the process essentially it's working with a professional it's not something that we would do in-house and then I see another question here from Barbara Blackwell have you been able to interview others uh, yeah, so we do have a number of interviews, um, and most of those were conducted between the 1960s and the 1990s. That's when, um, through the, the Long Beach Public Library, they had a really extensive oral history um, initiative that they undertook, interviewing all types of people, um, you know, who played different roles in Long Beach history. And um, more recently, we've been able to talk with Jody Miller and with um, her uncle, Paul Liera, who was Manuel and Concepcion's son, who we did that, that walk and talk through Virginia Country Club. It looks like there's a question from Joyce and Martin that did the Lieras have children while living at the rancho? They did. So they had one daughter who was actually born at the rancho. Manuel delivered her himself because the doctor didn't make it to the Adobe in time. So think about that next time you're in the rancho. Um, <laughs> you know, the rancho was incredibly remote at this time. And so it, uh, the doctor didn't make it in time. And so Manuel delivered the baby. Um, they did go on to have several other children after they had moved out of the rancho in 1929. And then I see Leslie Reese has a question, are interview transcriptions available as well as audio? Leslie, I'm so glad you asked. Uh, that is a project that we are undertaking right now. That's part of this overall um, digitization of the oral history collection. And so um, we do have some transcriptions and we're editing them and we're, we're adding more to the collection as well. So um, the goal is to have these, these amazing interviews available um, both through audio and also through written transcript. And that's in process right now. We do have a question from YouTube. Um, Sandra is asking, how many photographs of the family do we have? And do we have photographs of other families as well, or just the Lieras? I'm sorry, I'm freezing up. Did you ask the question? <laughs> yes, so I, didn't sorry. Hear I can type it in the chat if we have another problem. Um, Sandra it, from YouTube is asking how many photographs of the families we have and if we have mostly Lieras or if we have photos of other families as well. 
We have photos of other families as well. The majority of our photographs are the Lieras. Um, and then we have some photographs that are kind of like unidentified, like their children and we can guess, you know, who they were based on kind of the time period, but we're not sure. Um, so the Lieras are the most documented of all these families between the extensive oral history interviews we have, the numbers of photographs we have of them. The fact that they would come back and celebrate their anniversary at the site and they actually did a televised interview in the 90s. Um, so the, the Lieras are extensively documented in, in a number of ways, but we do have photographs of others as well in our collection. Um, so not, not as many as I would like, unfortunately, but we do have, we do have a decent number of photographs. A few more questions in the chat, Sarah. Okay. Um, isn't that Mike Murillo in your intro slide? Um, that is, yeah. So this is, I can screen share. So that's him in the first slide. Oops. Mike Murillo or Miguel Murillo, he went by both. So that's him there. Um, and then I saw another question. Did the tenants share the kitchen? No, they actually, um, it depends on the time period that the house kind of transitioned over time. But once Manuel and Concepcion married, um, they moved into a separate apartment of the house. And so they had their own kitchen. Another question from YouTube. Was it hard to find the other families and was it hard to get them to be interviewed? Like, was there a language barrier? Um, so the interviews, we're building this exhibit on interviews that we already have in our collection. So I didn't have to track down people for interviews. I did have some additional conversations with the Liera descendants, but these interviews already were in our collection um, and they were all with um, people who were fluent in English. So there wasn't a language barrier. Um, let's see, I had heard or read somewhere that the Virginia Country Club golf course furnished lighting to the Liera wedding. Lighting, is this correct? It is correct. Yeah. So they, they strung lights over from the Virginia Country Club because the Adobe didn't have electricity at the time. So um, yes, the Virginia Country Club did offer lighting for that. Uh, did you have the interview when the Lieras would come back on their anniversaries? And I think Loretta Berner did. Never mind. I was going to ask if we had that TV show, but you answered that it was made. Yes. So we do have, um, we do have the TV recording as well. Um, what kinds of stories did the Cal State Long Beach students bring to light during the capstone class you mentioned? So they, um, you know, with doing research projects, they would come in with a specific research question. So one that comes to mind for me is one student researched um, medicine and health and, you know, me medicine practices. And that's, I had heard before that the Lieras, um, you know, that, that the baby was born through a home birth, but I learned more about that process through that student's research, um, given kind of the larger context of, um, of more traditional Mexican use of, of herbs and healing and medicine in that sense. And so that was one that really stood out. Um, other students focused on schools in the Long Beach area, um, Americanization programs and school segregation in Southern California. That was another project that was incredibly informative. Um, and so the students used, you know, resources from the Rancho collection, but also um, they shared information. They had done some research at the Historical Society of Long Beach. And of course they did outside research as well. Um, so that was really wonderful to have those extensive research projects from the students. So for the exhibit's timeline, um, that is going to be pushed back because we are hiring a new curator. Um, so the plan is to have something open at the end of the year, uh, but I'm not quite sure on details at this time. I would agree. I was really impressed by the Cal State Long Beach students' research. Um, it was so much fun working with them, even just from the beginning of, of the questions that they came up with and the topics that they decided to research. Um, yeah, it was just, it was really wonderful. And I, I really hope that we can continue working with those history students on future research projects because they really brought a lot to, to the way we use our archives. Um, Any other questions? 
All right, Sarah, I want to say thank you for giving us a glimpse of uh, the richness of the RLC archives and kudos to you for working with the students and with uh, the Lieras and their descendants and so many others to follow up on the good work of, I think that was Mickey Melivold in the picture with um, the Lieras in the library and uh, I'm not sure who it was that did the oral history, but this is a long project, a long term in uh, long-term and now digitized um, through another partnership. So how exciting that this is all coming to fruition. Thank you for making that available to us. Uh, next you. up is Marie, who's gonna tell us a little bit about um, something exciting going on in the gardens. Hi, well, as you know, the Rancho Gardens have been open for almost a year, about a year, because uh, we opened up in June last year. And the folks that have been coming to the garden have had the opportunity to stroll on their own, stop where they want to. They've had the opportunity to utilize Clio and sometimes use the folder so that it gives them a little bit of information if they so chose. But effective this month, actually this week, we are going to once again offer garden docent tours. And it occurred to me that all of these people who've been coming to the rancho, um, th there's such a, the serenity is, is you, you can't beat the serenity. And that is a gift and a treasure that obviously is near and dear to my heart. But one of the things that I find fascinating is to sort of look behind the scenes and learn more about the things I'm looking at. And the garden docents can do that. So I'm really encouraging you and to put it out there to the public that this is something that you can come to the rancho and actually experience. Not only do you get to see the gardens, but you also have the opportunity to hear the stories of the plants. And you also get to choose how long and potentially what gardens you wanna look at. So if you think your stamina is only up for a half an hour, you don't have to take the full hour garden tour. You can say, I've got a half an hour, what do you recommend? And the garden docents will discuss it with them so that they give them options. You can see the backyard, or perhaps you would prefer to see the California Native Garden and maybe the inner courtyard. So we are changing things up, and yet we are still utilizing this incredible powerhouse of knowledge and energy and enthusiasm called our docents. And I wanted to remind you that this is happening and invite you to come and here's some of the stories of the garden. And that's my, that's my pitch this week or month, whatever it is. Thank you. Hi, me again. Uh, so I wanna give an update on the parlor and the living room. Uh, so if you have been around the site, you might have seen some changes and um, you, know, you probably saw that call for volunteers to empty out the parlor. So that was something that I thought was gonna take four work days and our amazing volunteers got it done in one work day. Uh, but the reason that we emptied out the parlor was in order to restore the parlor space so that we could restore the, the entire living room. And so uh, we've emptied out that ace and Mill Rock, the, um, the restoration firm that we've worked with for Llewellyn Jr.'s bedroom, the sleeping porch, the other half of the living room, um, bathrooms, closets, the, the uh, 1930s restoration that we had been working on before, we brought them back to essentially complete the living room restoration that they had started. Um, so by emptying out the parlor, the 1870s parlor, we could complete that restoration project. Uh, so I have some more pictures to show of what it looks like right now, uh, just to give you an idea of the work in progress. So that is the parlor. It's now emptied out. And this uh, gives you the full view of the ceiling and balcony. And in case you didn't know or you hadn't seen them before, these are the doorbell chimes, those doorbell chimes from the 1930s. They're now visible. So you can see they're all set up for the restoration work in there. Very obvious. You can see both that the floors don't match, the paint colors are different. So the idea is to restore the entire room um, to do our due diligence as stewards of the historic site and make sure that everything is properly restored and maintained um, and up to date. And then um, 
that restoration work should be completing by the end of the summer. And then um, the plans are still to be determined as far as when we'll bring the parlor back. Um, the parlor is not going away. And we are looking for ways to be able to offer both the 1930s grand living room in all its glory and also that 1870s parlor. So that is still in process, but for now, what we're really excited about is being able to restore the entire 1930s living room. Um, and yeah, I think that's all I wanted to say about that, but I just wanted to thank the volunteers that have been so helpful with that with that project of moving everything out of there. I was incredibly daunted by getting all of our parlor furnishings and, and you know artifacts out of there. They were all carefully wrapped and, and now they're stored in, um, we have an offsite storage unit that has air conditioning and security and they're all safely stored offsite um, in anticipation of when they will be coming back on site. And I think this is the last point that I will have the mic for the evening. So since I have the floor, I'm gonna go off script for a moment and just take this time to, um, to really emphasize my deeply felt appreciation for our volunteers. Uh, my time at the Rancho five and a half years has been incredibly rewarding. I feel so lucky and grateful to have worked in such an amazing place. The history is amazing. The site is beautiful but it's really about the people. Um, I just feel so lucky to have worked with such an incredible team of volunteers. And so I just wanted to take this moment to thank you all and tell you that I'm gonna miss you all very much. I will stay in touch. I'll never forget you. And I just feel so lucky. So thank you. I am up next to give an update on house uh, options. Um, we will have guided tours, as Marie said, both of the garden and of the house. So far, we've been able to do a refresher with 24 of our um, house docents, which is exciting. Uh, if you have not done a walkthrough with myself or with Laura, we're still happy to do that with uh, trained docents. We have a group of partially or almost fully trained docents, and those are our school docents. We will be having um, a program on Thursday morning and an email will be coming out tomorrow about that. Um, but school docents who would like to become house docents, it's really just a bit more. And Sarah just gave you the rundown of the tenant era um, it, tonight. So you're even a step closer. Um, we have also um, put in place uh, we, and now sampled with many, many volunteers over the past week or two. Thank you, a brand new walking guide, which updates the one that we currently have. Those who have given feedback, it has um, been put in and uh, that's just about ready to go. We of course have the Clio tour. All of these things are gonna be working together, whether people wanna use their own device for a tour, want to use a printed walking guide. Um, if they want to go on a guided tour of the house or a guided tour of the garden, that's coming to a rancho near you that you love and adore just like we all do. So thank you to all those who have persisted um, in the various ways through the pandemic to continue to keep our doors open and more resources and more tour formats are on the way. Um, I do want to give one, uh, save the date, which is on June 30th, Wednesday, June 30th, all of the public hour volunteers, whether you're a wayfinder, a greeter, a house docent, or a garden docent, please join us that evening for um, a discussion about tours and tour formats and best practices at the Rancho um, that evening, June 30th, Wednesday, June 30th at 5.30. Please do have that on your calendar. Meanwhile, we are experimenting, and I want to tell you that our first Spanish language tour was guided by Ligia last week. I think our first, uh, possibly one of our first English language tours was guided, I heard, by Terry last week. And now I have something very special to share, because our very first pandemic era tours were checkout tours guided for me and Allison by these two. On the left is Tom Heaton, brand new docent at the Rancho because he finished his checkout tour. 
On the right is Jacqueline Thacker, and she guided a successful tour as well, wonderful pandemic era checkout tours. In the center, of course, is Allison. And in the background is, as you can see, the living room slash parlor. Hey, here's a tip. If somebody working at the ranch ever says, you want to see something cool? Say yes. <laughs> what we got to see was a little excavated portion of the floor in the parlor that had been spongy. And so the restoration crew picked it up. And because Allison was there, we were invited to come in and see it. But I thought you'd also enjoy this picture, not just to see our two newest docents, our executive director, the parlor under restoration, uh, but the Rancho back in action. Congratulations to Tom and to Jacqueline and to all the docents who have uh, been working public hours and just super excited to talk to people again. That's coming. All right, Alana. Hello, back again. Um, so we have been talking about uh, how Sarah will be leaving soon, but I invite you to travel back with me to January 5th, 2016, um, by all accounts, a rainy Tuesday morning when Sarah Wolk had her first day on site at Rancho Los Cerritos as our curator. Um, I think we knew then that she was the right person for the job, but I don't think we could have imagined um, everything that she would accomplish in her time at Rancho Los Cerritos. So I do have uh, a little something to share that I am calling the Sarah Fitzgerald legacy. Um, so since January 5th, 2016, um, Sarah has gotten a lot accomplished, um, including several exhibits. Um, the Big Spies Came West, which was a commemoration of the 150 year anniversary of the Big Spies arriving. Um, and then following that, the Literary Lives of the Big Spies, an exhibit honoring the writers of the ranchos, um, specifically focusing on some of the women writers. And then Building a New California, the Lives and Labor of Chinese Immigrants from 1850 to 1930. And um, then most recently, um, the one that is pictured, the Tibahangna to Today, Stories of the Tongva People. Um, and then as you can see, just spreading light and laughter everywhere that she was. Um, she also, um, this is, she helped out with camp. She was always um, very uh, happy to step in and help with other things um, and represented the Rancho um, at a lecture series for the Long Beach Public Library local history series uh, about Tibahanga to today, um, native history at Rancho Los Cerritos. Um, another Long Beach Public Library Foundation um, presentation uh, after the fire, the Long Beach Public Library at Rancho Los Cerritos, um, and also the history of Rancho Los Cerritos. Um, she she also, um, again, just always smiling uh, and collaborated with Tongva educators and scholars, including those pictured um, Craig Torres, Cindy Alvitre, Julia Bogany, and Desiree Martinez. Um, she also partnered or collaborated with the Chinese Historical Society of Southern California, the LA as Subject Resident Archivist Program, the Arts Council for Long Beach. She's had, I don't know how many interns over the past few years, um, and also introduced programs like the Foodways of the West lecture series, talking about labor lecture series, and the Tongva Educational Program series, um, started the textile committee, um, helped continue on the nitrate negative scanning. Um, in personal news, she got to marry Brian since starting, or as I call him, Mr. Sarah, hello, or now Mr. Dr. Sarah, since she is now a PhD. Um, she also had Nicholas, who has joined on some meetings. This is a year ago, so he, he is uh, with us today looking a little bit older. Um, and then we had the, the pleasure of celebrating Sarah uh, in person yesterday, um, and so, it was um, a lovely event getting to see people in person again and really um, celebrate Sarah and all of her contributions. Um, I know that for me personally, um, Sarah is such a wonderful combination of supportive, like whatever you need, she's there, and also kind of challenging us to think outside the box and think about new ways of doing things and has really um, 
made the rancho a better place in all of this time. Um, and she was presented with a gift um, for uh, the family's new home in Georgia. Um, so I don't know if you can tell there's some fly swatters, uh, a plunger for the toilet, a dustpan, uh, some Lowe's gift cards. So you know all the stuff you need when you uh, have your first home. And um, so she was presented with that. And then we had a lovely celebration and send off. And as has been mentioned, we are, of course, um, happy for her, proud of her, but sad to see her go. Uh, so on behalf of um, the staff, and I'm sure of the volunteers, thank you, Sarah, so much for all that you have brought to the Rancho and best of luck with um, all of your future endeavors. And I will stop sharing now. Thank you so much. That was so nice. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. So I believe I'm now passing it over to Laura. Hi, everyone. I'm unmuted now. And so now comes the time of the evening when uh, we get to see all of you and you're all still here. That number hasn't gone down. So I'm very excited. Uh, once we uh, promote you all to panelists and we can see you, I will present my question for the night for the, I don't know, 14th time. <laughs> so Sit tight, it'll look like you're leaving, but you will uh, come right back in. I see Brian, hi Brian. Hello. Hi, Brian. So as you are joining us, please feel free to turn on your video if you feel comfortable doing so. <laughs> and then um, you can mute and unmute yourselves when you are feeling ready or called upon to uh, share with the group. Almost done, Laura. Just sit tight. The last couple. I can't get the phone number one to promote. I don't know if a phone can be a panelist. So if you're coming in with your phone number 562253, sorry, 537, you're unmuted. Um, Okay, is everybody here? So yeah, I also can't get Joan to promote. Yeah, I can't either. All right, so Joan and the phone number will just be able to hear us. Okay, well, as we all probably know, this Sunday will be the start of summer. So I thought I would start the conversation with what is everybody's most anticipated activity that you do in the summertime? It's a really easy question for me. My favorite activity is going backpacking and I only do it in the summertime, except for this year, I have already been backpacking, which was technically spring and I got snowed on. So it really should be a summer, <laughs> summertime activity. <laughs> so, um, We'll do pass the mic. Um, I will pass it off to Brian. What is your favorite summertime activity that you're looking forward to? Which Brian? Am I the only Brian? You is are Mr. Dr. Brian. Sarah Brian there? <laughs> no, you're the Brian. Okay. 
Um, <laughs> Uh, I really love visiting historic sites. This is an opportunity to check out even more. So I try to see as many as I possibly can. Um, I'm thinking Santa Barbara is going to be, I've never seen the adobes there. I've only ever been to the mission. So I think I'm going to do a Santa Barbara day uh, and check out a lot of the adobes, including the De La Guerra family, who is one of the families I do research on. So it'd be cool to see their property. Yeah. That sounds good. So you want to pass the mic to somebody? Yes. Marie. I, I don't know that I have a favorite summer activity. I spend a lot of time outside sort of year round. And I, and I love the beach and I, but I go to the beach in the winter. Um, with summer hours being later, then that does mean that I am sometimes um, still birding or hiking after work. Uh, sometimes getting late back to go to bed at a reasonable hour. My reasonable, not everybody else's reasonable. Um, so that's what I guess I do in the summertime. And I guess I will pass it on to one of our new docents to Jacqueline. Thank you, Maria. And I'm living in Southern California. I think my summer is the same things I do all winter because we are outdoors much. Growing up where there was definite seasons, when there was snow and cold, you know, summertime, you know, meant when you started going to the lakes and you started, you know, being outdoors and go to the local swimming pools. But I'd say in California that it's really the same things I do all year round. So I'm going to do the same thing, Marie. I'm going to go to Tom. Did he drop off? <laughs> no, there he is. Hi, Tom. Unmute. Okay. So it's summertime. Like you said, it's summer all the time. Um, I just got back from Hawaii about uh, four weeks ago. So hopefully I'll be doing some more uh, swimming here and, uh, oh, and of course, gardening, that's, that's a, a daily, daily ritual here. But uh, yeah, so it's just gonna be, you know, more, more really? of good things. Really? And let's see, how about if I go to Megan? Well, summertime for me was our family camp. My family, um, from when I was four years old until I was in college, and I went to the wrong college because it was a family camp for its sister campus, the Berkeley family camp called Lair of the Bear. And we went every summer for a week. And then when I had kids and my youngest one was four years old, in other words, out of diapers, I started bringing them every summer and now they're in their twenties. So they're a little old for that. So I have rented a cabin with my sister and whoever drops in on us in the 10 days that we have it rented for, I will be up there for the first two weeks of August. Pinecrest, California is where it is. There's a lake there, but a small lake. It's not a water skiing lake. There's hiking, it's just beautiful. I even made Laura one time go on a backpacking trip up there because it's my favorite place in the entire world. And I can't wait to be going back up there as well. Thank you. Uh, Barbara, in addition to reading the library book, what are you gonna do this summer? Excuse me, I needed to unmute myself. <laughs> uh, more reading, of course. I hope to do some, a few short trips. Don't know exactly where yet, but I'm dying to get out of Long Beach for a little while. And uh, maybe I'll go up to Oregon and see Steve Dudley, who is on this call with us and uh, is my cousin. I haven't seen him in almost two years now. So anyway, a little bit of travel and reading books and uh, kind of excited about being able to just get out <laughs> and not worry so much. So, okay, I'll pass it on to Steve. <laughs> hear me now? Uh-huh. Well, thank you, Barbara. It's nice to, <laughs> nice to be 
part of the group today. Uh, Oregon's a beautiful place at the moment. Uh, for summertime, one is always happy to have it here. You get out in the garden, you ride a bicycle, you uh, go for walks, uh, you do all those things that you can't do uh, so easily during the winter time. But uh, uh, it's, it's a pleasant time of the year and also fun to be uh, remotely down at the Las Rita's and see what uh, uh, Sarah is up to and what's going on in the living room. Uh, great changes, uh, some good things happening uh, uh, around a place I remember so well. So i end with that. I don't know how to pass it on to somebody else, however. You just pick a name, Steve. I don't. I don't know who else is on because I don't on my screen. I don't have the other names. Oh, so oh. you you go and pick pick a name. Well, I guess we have to hear from Sarah since you just mentioned her. All right, I love eating dinner outdoors in summer because you have sunlight for later hours. You have the nice weather for it. There's just like a feeling of excitement in the year. I love dining al fresco for dinner, especially barbecues. Um, it's such a priority that we are moving on June 20th and we already have our Lowe's order set up for the barbecue to arrive on June 21st. Uh, we are moving from a one bedroom apartment to a four bedroom house with a backyard. So we look forward to taking advantage of it and having space to dine al fresco and barbecue. So that's what I'm excited about. And I'm gonna pass it over to Toby. Oh, first of all, Sarah, I wish I had more time with you because I've heard such wonderful things about you. So I'm glad I had some time, wish it was longer. Um, I'm looking forward to having sharing some birthdays. Uh, my sister's birthday's in June. I have a very special friend's birthday in July and weren't able to celebrate last year. So we're all looking forward to having a you know, nice gathering and a barbecue. And I will pass it to Joy. Joy, you have to unmute. <laughs> Sorry about that. I was trying to be a good citizen and stay muted. Um, normally, pre-pandemic, we would always go uh, in the summer to what used to be called the Mozart Festival. Uh, now is called Festival Mosaic. In San Luis Obispo. In San Luis Obispo. And we would stay with dear friends that I've known for over 50 years. Now, uh, this summer, though, a special occasion in August, we will be attending my grandson's bar mitzvah in Chicago. So that's going to be a big deal to fly, yeah, to fly all that distance. Thank you for the cheers. Uh, no, I have to pick somebody. Um, how about Nancy and Floyd? Okay, now we're there. Okay. Well, I we are really, really hoping that Ireland will open up for tourism because our son and our granddaughters are there and we haven't seen them since two years ago. So if that, the minute it opens up, we'll be flying to Ireland, but it may not open up. We don't know. It's still pretty locked down. But other than that, what do we do in the summer? Well, uh, we, we spend some time at the beach. <laughs> uh, but one of the things I'd like to say, I was really glad to see Steve uh in, in this uh haven't seen him uh in, in quite some time and so thanks for coming <laughs> a little older maybe a little wiser i don't know <laughs> <laughs> of so, course. let me see let me pick kathleen good afternoon everyone when the pandemic hit, there were no more reenactments and I sewed three outfits, one in anticipation of the American Revolution, but I just got in the mail an invite to the American Independence Day at the Printing Museum in Torrance. Has everybody been? It's a great place. It's $15 at the door. It's wonderful. We usually dress up American uh, Revolution. This year, I thought I'd do Spanish. Governor Fodge's wife, who arrived in 1779. And I'll show you part of the outfit I made for her. So this is what I'll be wearing. I got to make the stomacher for it. So 
It's a great event if you haven't been. So I look forward to all these new events popping up. Also, uh, Heritage Park, uh, Orange County in Anaheim's having something at the end of the month. Uh, check it out. So slowly things are coming ab about. We're planning the Balliol Women's Gun at Dominguez. I mean, we don't even know what that's going to look like, right? Also, Battle Real San Gabriel and next January at Sanchez Adobe and Marva. Again, everything we're planning, but we don't know what things will look like because we don't know how COVID friendly everything has to be. It's a real, it's a real trial. But I also have to prepare for classes. I teach freshmen at Cal State Long Beach. And it was a real trial. We're Zooming again. We're not on campus. Uh, and it was re a real trial <laughs> or deal by trial to learn how to deal with uh, papers through Zoom. All right, thank you. Um, who hasn't spoken? Marsha. Okay, there goes our Sarah Newmark. Marsha. You mute. I'm getting up. I was doing Fanny on Zoom before this, so I'm actually Fanny, not Sarah now. Um, normally, my favorite thing in the summer is mud mania, and unfortunately, I can't do that. And then second thing I like in the summer is greeting all the people at the concerts. But for this year, the thing I have set up to do is my service animal, Lorraine. I get to get recertified with her, and that's what I'm looking forward to because she's been my hero. And then who do I pick? Let's see. How's the Model T running, Marsha? Well, right now it's been a garage queen because I lost my eyesight, so I can't drive too well, but it's going to get back out. I passed the one eye driving test, so I'm surprised that I did. But So I actually cranked it yesterday and it worked. But, Good. Um, but luckily, Laura got me a ride to come to the rancho, so I, didn't, I was going to try to drive it to go there. But if I would have broken down, nobody knows how to drive me home in it, so... Well, I can. <laughs> you can help me. Oh, good. I need help with changing a tire. <laughs> but I'm glad. I'm glad you're here too. Because when I when they said you were there, I still can't see the names. But when they said you were there and you started talking, I was like, yeah. Well, um, let me see. Picking somebody um, is. Uh, I thought you said is Joy Joyce and Martin are there somewhere. Are they there? Or no? They are there. They don't have their camera on, but. Let's see if they're willing to. Uh, We're here. Oh, they're there. Okay, you guys can talk. <laughs> Thanks, Marcia. <laughs> Good you. Well, you look forward to uh, concerts in the park usually. Um, usually, the Los Cerritos Park has concerts every Wednesday. Uh, they're not going to have it this year, so we're going to miss that. Um, we also like the concerts at the Rancho and listening to uh, Bernie Pearl. <laughs> it's true and yeah, funny enough but we too are going to Chicago later this summer uh, to see <laughs> our, our niece whose niece and nephew who are having their first child mm -hmm. um, I would like to say a personal shout out to Steve Dudley for thanks for joining us I have spent many hours at the visitor center reading the Bixby family history and never remembering all the names <laughs> but it's still always interesting so thank you Steve you're welcome. Thank you. We're going to pass this on to, okay, Edie Pearl. It's you. It's, you're up, Edie. Oh, maybe not. I'm going to give it to Joan. Okay. Joan, are you still there? Joan's I don't think Joan has microphone. Okay. Uh, All right. So who am I missing? Terry. Terry Barber. You're up, Terry. You're muted, Terry. Got it. I have two things that I do every year that I just love doing. And um, one of them is I go fishing. And I'm not going to be going the same time Megan's gone. Uh, the first two weeks of August, we go to Mammoth, and we may stay in Mammoth. That is by no means where we are most of the time. We're in June Lake or somewhere in the Loop or Mono Lake, or last year we went to Bodie. I just can't stay away from the old ghost town. I love it. 
and we just travel all over the place. And then when we get back from there, we have already planned. And I like to do little tours, day tours, so that if I want to have a glass of wine, I don't have to worry about driving home at 10 o'clock at night. And so we're doing a tour down to Laguna Beach and we're going to the Festival of Arts later in August. So I'm real happy about those things, but looking forward to this getting away from the heat. <laughs> so I think that's about everybody. Oh, Edie, did you say something? Sure. I'm looking forward to barbecuing, barbecuing, barbecuing outside and a few friends over and enjoying the yard and the outdoors and a slower paced summer than my summers usually are. I'm kind of just want to in, take the time to enjoy stuff. So that's what I'm going to do. And I can't see anybody else on my screen. Can you see the me? The only person who hasn't gone yet is Linda. Okay, let's hear to... from Linda. Do you want to tell us what is your summer favorite activity, Linda? Okay, Linda's being bashful. So, we'll... oh, I'm not bashful. Oh. I just can't get the right buttons pushed. All right, there you go. <laughs> okay, so I'm in North Carolina. I've been to a graduation at the Charlotte Motor Speedway which was an interesting use of that space. I've been out on Lake Norman and I've visit, taken some tours with my daughter-in-law of places that we both lived here at one time in Huntersville. And I'll be home Friday. And then later I'm going up to um, Pleasant Hill to visit my daughter there. And we'll go to a music festival, which we're so glad is being held in Petaluma, which supports education there. And it's just gonna be a fun time. So I don't know what else I'm doing, but I hope to be at the Rancho some. And if you heard me, I'm so pleased because um, I have a little phone that I am working with. We heard you loud and clear. Oh, very good. And I'm sorry I missed this morning's or yesterday's um, coffee chat because um, the timing difference meant I'd have to be up and ready too early. <laughs> I can understand that. <laughs> All right, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, all you people that aren't here with us live, if you watch it on YouTube, remember to log on to Volgistics and log those hours for under uh, volunteer enrichment. Um, other volunteer opportunities, there's always gardening, gardening on Tuesday mornings. Uh, garden crafts the first Friday from 9.30 to 12.30. Um, curatorial work days, um, we don't have a lot. We have um, Thursdays is being the curatorial work day going forward from 1030 um, to 1230. If anybody is um, wanting to help out with either dusting or inventorying. And of course, public hours with going to um, offering guided garden and house tours every day. We do need more volunteers. We have a, had a big influx. I've been, I've met with at least half a dozen volunteers and I have four or five more uh, scheduled. Um, a lot of young people, teens that um, can now uh, fill in for public hours because we have roles for people that aren't um, trained docents. So that's a great thing for them, but, and they're going to help us do those, uh, meet all of our greeting the public needs, but we do need house docents and garden docents to sign up to share the wonderful site with everybody. And of course you can do that on Volgistics. If anybody has ha not ha been able to log on yet, uh, just send me an email and I'll get you set up. Um, we have our bi-monthly coffees on the second and fourth Monday of the month at 10 a.m. Just getting together and talking about whatever comes to mind next month. 
uh, the third Tuesday, 5.30, we'll be here again for our virtual gathering and the month after that. And then the month after that, we're going to be in person for our long delayed volunteer appreciation dinner at the Reef. So everybody put that date on your calendar, September 21. And... I think that's it. Thank you all for coming and I look forward to seeing you around the rancho. Good night. Bye. Bye. Bye, Sarah. Bye, Sarah. Bye, Nicholas. I love you. Bye, Nicholas. Bye, Bye. Bye Sarah. Bye. Bye. Be well, everybody. Take care. Zoom care. Bye, Bye. 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 Bye Sarah and Nicholas. Take care. <laughs> bye. Okay. Can you say bye bye? Hi, hey, Philly. Bye. Hi. He's so pretty. Can you say bye bye? Um, <laughs> it's wonderful. Alana, <laughs> your presentation was fabulous. Oh, thank you. It was, no, it, was. it was really, really <laughs> the big circle of, yeah, beginning to, to now. It's great. I'm impressed. I did not cry. <laughs> I cried so easily. And I was like, Sarah's leaving. <laughs> no. was emotional for sure. It was beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Well, I think I'm going to end it for everyone. So to anyone who's still watching, thank you for joining us and we'll see you soon virtually or in person.